People think they they a ask the officer for legal advice essentially. Well, what right. should I do? Hey, if you just tell me everything, like everything will be easier on you. If you tell me where you've hidden anything else, just let me know, and, and I can help you. I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> These are all lies, mm -hmm. and uh, people need to understand that police officers are legally allowed to lie to them. You're not allowed to lie to them. But they're allowed to, to lie yeah, to you. Yeah, ask Martha Stewart. Right, Martha Stewart. Uh, if I ever, you know, see Martha Stewart, I might have to hold back saying something like, if you had, you know, seen my video, <laughs> you would not be in the door, situation uh, where, you, where you were. Um, she probably would not have wound up in prison, but she, she did what most people do, is they tried to talk themselves out of it, and she wound up making inconsistent statements and was put away for obstruction of justice. Right. Um, so she, as soon as she was on the phone with an SEC officer, which is you know, a law enforcement officer, would say, oh, we're from the SEC, you don't think they're police, but they're police. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys, but I, I really just can't talk to you right now until I, I speak with my lawyer first. I hope you understand. I have to go now. Yeah. <laughs> Hang up. Lawyer. Guess what? Well, I think I she's a great example yeah. because obviously she's a very smart person, very Brilliant, successful, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. she didn't have enough sense to keep her mouth shut mm -hmm. and to simply say, you'll have to discuss that with my attorney. Right. Um, so if you're poor and powerless, don't feel so bad. Cause, exactly. Because the uh, wealthy and powerful are just as mm -hmm. dumb. Um, if I can put it that way. Defense lawyers tell me about fellow defense lawyers that they know who've waived their constitutional right. rights during police encounters because they, they just didn't play it through in, in right. their own head. And that, that strikes me as uh, that's pretty odd, but it, certainly anything is possible. I mean, mm -hmm. you hear of police officers who, who get duped into confessing when uh, they come up against the bad, good cop, bad cop routine. I mm -hmm. mean, so it, it, it's quite amazing how these... these these tactics are quite powerful and popular uh, for, for a reason. They well, work. And there's really just nothing good that can come of a conversation with police after your arrest. You know, if, if you share exculpatory facts with them, you know, if you share evidence that might somehow ultimately prove your innocence, that isn't going to be conveyed by them to the prosecutor. You know, they're not necessarily going to just turn around and say, actually, it sounds like this guy has a really good explanation for why we should never have arrested him in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, if they really were on your side, they wouldn't have put you in cuffs the first time around. Right. So th there isn't anything good that's going to happen from you carrying on right. in that situation. Police often use something that's very powerful. They use, uh, um, if you're, if, you know, for young people uh, who, are, who are arrested, um, for contraband, they say, if you give us names, if you turn on people, we'll help you out. You can never assume if you're ever if someone's unfor unfortunate enough to be in that situation that the officer will actually hold to their word. They don't even necessarily have the power to do that. They're trying to get you to reveal more information. Right. So we have gotten calls from people who've been in situations like that, and frequently we get phone calls from people who are dealing with a fresh legal situation where they've just a friend of theirs has just been arrested for something they've been arrested mm -hmm. and the only thing we tell them is to shut up do not talk to police officers anymore that will not help you you must get a lawyer immediately there's nothing else i can do for you like you you mm -hmm. our information is sort of a legal prophylactic i mean at this point it's it's broken and uh, and you're dealing with you're trying to put pieces together the lawyer is the only person you should be speaking to about this you know do not talk to do not talk to any more police officers at this point you know if you've already done a lot of damage uh, you can only dig yourself into a deeper hole by continuing well, i guess uh, that goes this. back to a myth that we're all tend to be taught as children perhaps if you're not a, a black child but uh, that the police are your friend, right? The police are there to help you. Mm. And, um, and in fact, that may be true in theory, but in, in, in practice, if you're engaged in doing something like living, that may not always be the case. They may just have, not, I don't want to say an agenda, but you know, I mean, they have certain goals and they have certain mindsets uh, in encounters. And, um, and you have to look at it as an adversarial situation because when you get in the legal system, and as soon as you touch a cop, you're into the legal system. Certainly. It is an adversarial situation. Um, that's 
that's another you know, reason why we, we do what we do. Is for me, I find it incredibly saddening that when you when when I was young, you know, when we were young, uh, we were taught that the police officer is your friend. And I would say this this does pretty much apply to to, to white folks, uh, uh, not so much African Americans, Latinos. They're they're not necessarily taught that um, for good reason. Uh, we're taught officer officer friendly is your friend. He's there to help you. Mm -hmm. And it's such a saddening state of affairs when we hear regular, frequent stories from people where they were honest with the police officer. And the officer said, if you're honest with me, I'll help you out. When being honest will hurt you. And it's the only thing that really can hurt you. Is really quite an upside down state of affairs. And that's something that, to my core, disappointments. I think that is something that is tremendously damaging to civil society when you have a situation where honest people, good people, nonviolent people, kind people, when they are honest in front of a police officer, it can destroy their life. That's twisted. There's something wrong with that. And so we feel if that is currently the state of affairs, which it is, we are we're helping people by offering them this information which is very counterintuitive. Not to lie to a police officer, but just stop talking to a police officer. Right. Mm -hmm. I would I would add though that you know well the well the police officer may not be your friend. They're they're certainly not necessarily your enemy either. An I'd adversary say, is not an enemy. Right. An enemy. And I would say I would say the Constitution is your friend um, in these situations. And the police officer most of the time is, is just doing their job. But an important part of their job is is respecting the Constitution and respecting you if you know how to use it properly. And that's what we hear most of the time from most police officers that we talk to about our work is that you know they're typically impressed with it. And they usually tell us that they're impressed when they meet a citizen who's familiar with their constitutional rights. I mean, it's something that you know police understand these rights. And to some extent, they understand how to bend them a little bit. But um, when the police officer discovers that you have a little bit of, of understanding of, of criminal procedure as well, and that's actually something, that's actually a shared interest between you and mm. them. And uh, if you can handle the situation and, you know, calmly and, and properly, the, the officer is usually not going to get nearly as upset with you as a lot of people might think. Right. That's, that's another thing we're always encountering is people say to us, they say, this isn't going to work. Why, how is this mm -hmm. really going to work? You're telling this doesn't make sense. If police, and this is another myth, if police want to search you, they're just going to search you. Police can do anything they want. There's this, there's this false view of the absolute, absolute power mm -hmm. of police. It's just not true. They've got so many uh, laws and regulations mm -hmm. regulating what they do. And of course, the highest law of the land is the Constitution um, that, they have, that, they are, that they take an oath to uh, abide by. So when we tell, you know, we instruct people to say, if you say to an officer calmly, Officer, I do not consent to any searches. They're going to hesitate because they're going to be thinking that you are mm -hmm. either a lawyer or a son of a lawyer or a son of a police officer or a daughter uh, of a police officer or a lawyer. They, well, I they, think that you're part of the family. Yeah, so you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're on a different game. level, man. Yeah. Like they are going to approach with caution mm -hmm. when you say things like, Am I free to go, officer? Why are you detaining me? Mm -hmm. You're going to get a very different reaction uh, from them, and they're going to they're going to be much more deferential if you're calm uh, when you deliver these lines. Mm. And there are officers out there that are ready to bend these rules. I mean, you know, people you know who who are very pessimistic about following our advice are not completely off. You know, I, what police often refer to it as as uh, the bad apple problem, you know, that there's a small percentage of officers out there that really are ready to bend these rules and, and ready to, to abuse their power for their own personal benefit or for, or for whatever reason. And you know, we don't deny that there are officers out there that, that perhaps won't respect your rights. But if you're going to encounter someone like that, it's better that you know your rights and it's better that you assert them so that when you end up in court, if you end up having to file a civil rights lawsuit, uh, it's not going to work if you waived your rights. Right. So the fact that there are all of the, you know, that there are, a, you know, a few too many, you know, pretty dirty cops out there, and, you know, we hear about them from time to time. They're not the majority, but they do exist. And the way to deal with that problem is to assert your rights just as you would when you're dealing with the most professional and respectful police officer on the street.
Okay, uh, I had a, a note about uh, under Miss ID. Um, yeah, that's that's an, another one that, um, that the ID issue really gets you know trickier and trickier all the time. Mm. The, the recent Supreme Court decision in in Heibel, uh was an, another unfortunate one, but you know a lot of people believe that. Uh, if an officer asks to see your ID, that you have to give it to them, and beyond that, uh, that you have to have an ID <laughs> to give to them, uh, which is also a myth that essentially um, you don't, you're not obligated to carry any ID of any kind unless you're driving an automobile or trying to get into an airport or, or that kind of thing. And we have some friends who aren't exactly thrilled about some of those regulations. Although, um, you know, it's, it's important for, uh, for people to understand that, in fact, according to Supreme Court precedent, the only time that you can actually be compelled to identify yourself to police, identifying yourself meaning saying what your name is, mm -hmm. um, honestly, whether or not you have a document to prove that, uh, that you can only be compelled to do that in a case where police have reasonable suspicion to believe that you're involved in some sort of criminal activity. And even then, uh, only about half the states actually have statutes where that requirement applies. So if you're in a situation where police are asking you to identify yourself, um, the thing to do is to ask if you're free to leave, if you would prefer not to identify yourself. And that's a choice that's up to you. But you ask if you're free to go. And if the officer says, no, you are being detained, then you know that the officer believes that they do have some kind of legal authority to detain you. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, it's, it's often going to make things easier for you if you do go ahead and, and tell them who you are. But I don't recommend that in every case. And if you have some specific reason to believe that revealing your identity in and of itself is not in your best interest, then you know, go ahead and, and, and withhold that information and test the officer, see whether they really do believe that they've got something, some legal authority to hold you. Because if they don't, and they arrest you for refusing to disclose your ID. They're the one that's getting sued. All right. Um, something else that, that is important, uh, you know, when we talk about all this, is asserting your constitutional rights isn't necessarily going to always be the easiest thing to do. It often might take more of your time. Mm -hmm. It often might make the officer uh, a little bit upset with you, uh, especially an officer that is not respectful of constitutional rights. Um, so this is something we encourage people to do is, you know, to always assert their rights, especially if you know you have nothing uh, to hide, is to test that, is to, st it, by using, you know, and asserting your constitutional rights, you do strengthen them. And what we are trying to, you know, create is a situation where police officers should have some expectation that from time to time, people are not going to consent to searches, and that people, in fact, will, will, will show that they are not very pleased with the situation by refusing to comply. Um, and we believe that if this continues to be the case, police officers will then be less likely to try to get all citizens uh, to try to consent to searches um, as frequently as they, they do. So that's something that it, that it is important to understand. Is that it, there might even be some situations where asserting your constitutional rights might not be the most efficient thing to do. That in fact, it might be a little bit of a challenge, uh, but we, regardless, we recommend people do it. The more people assert these rights, the less challenging it becomes to do so. Because you know, if police and, and, and courts and prosecutors become more accustomed to confronting these situations, uh, they have a plan for how to deal with it. I mean, the the dreadfully small percentage of people that actually assert their Fourth Amendment rights during police encounters contributes to a situation where prosecutors aren't, aren't really accustomed to having to deal with a situation where the evidence that they're now trying to charge somebody with is was illegally obtained, for example. And so they haven't had the occasion to go and lecture their officers about making sure that they follow the Fourth Amendment because it's so easy mm -hmm. to get consent. Right. That uh, that it's not really a, a big issue, but um, uh, a friend of ours, uh, former Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper, um, who had a, a lengthy career in law enforcement, um, tells a story of when he was a, a young officer um, who was very excited about going out and just busting everybody that he could, you know, making as many arrests as possible right. and really getting those you know, notches, ma right, right, making a name for himself in the department. And you know, one day he came in with a bad arrest. 
mm -hmm. you know, somebody who you know, he didn't have a right to search that guy, and uh, and he ended up getting confronted by the prosecutor. Said, "What the hell are you doing, man? This isn't this isn't how we do it. I can't do anything with this case." Do you understand that, that you're supposed to be defending the Constitution? You're not supposed to be mm. bending over backwards and pushing these rules around to, to bring people in. I can't do anything with this. You know, you've wasted my time. And, and uh, Chief Stamper says that that was really a turning point for him, getting yelled at and, and realizing that, you know, there was a balance here. And mm. he was part of, part of a team of people and that if he didn't follow the rules, it created problems for everybody else. And so as citizens, if we start asserting our rights, we can actually start to force these other participants in the criminal justice system to deal with that fact. And I think that the more comfortable they become with it, the easier it becomes for people, you know, in the aftermath of this to, to also assert their rights as well and, and get the outcome that the Constitution promises them. I made a note earlier about public defenders, and uh, I was thinking in the context that um, well, again, this documentary I saw recently, the guy said that, you know, some most public defenders are funded by their local counties, and, and some are good, and most are awful. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't, they're not being paid a whole lot for what they're doing. Whereas if you get a lawyer and you give him a check for $5,000, he's going to do a lot more for you than a public defender. But I would say that that constitutes another myth, arguably, that public de the myth that public defenders are crap. If you if you get uh, arrested for something and you're facing time, never hire a public defender. You need to hire a, a, a private attorney because they're much better. Mm -hmm. This is a big mistake that many people uh, make, especially lower income people. I think mm -hmm. really, really wind up getting screwed as a result of that I'm not mindset. Saying they don't have any value at all, but right. Mm -hmm. But in fact, public defenders are oftentimes fierce advocates. Uh, because they're they're doing this because this is what they really want to do. I mean, they really take much pride in their craft. Not only that, but they really do understand the ins and outs of the system and are better placed, mm -hmm. oftentimes. So they're uh, having a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They, they wouldn't do this miserable job if they yeah. didn't believe in it. Mm -hmm. So public defenders are 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 good uh, for the most part. Of course, there's there's going to be a, a distribution uh, of talent like in any other field. Right. Uh, but the idea that you never want to hire a public defender is is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cer certainly that's not a, a categorical rule by any means. And in, in fact, there's there's been extensive research uh, conducted in, in this area. And, and my understanding is that that on the whole, if you look at, at the sentences that, that people you know bring back in terms of you know the ratio of you know convictions versus acquittals and so forth, that public defenders actually get the same quality results mm -hmm. on if you the control whole for income. as as private attorneys so you know just as there are you know public defender you know services out there that, that aren't up to par and that, that are are in many cases underfunded and so on and so forth you know it, it's also frequently the case that private attorneys will take on cases that they're not qualified to take so you know it really depends and i mean i've i have heard of of you know there have been cases where somebody actually you know went out of their way to avoid the public defender service and hired a private attorney got convicted and on you know on appeal had to argue well my private attorney was incompetent <laughs> you know and they, they didn't know what what they were doing and so you know it's it's something if, if you're going to hire a private attorney make sure that they know what they're doing right well and, they specialize in criminal law yeah, right and, yeah. and b before uh, before rejecting the public defender you know learn a little bit about what the public defender service in your area is like for example here in Washington DC we have one of the best in the country mm -hmm. so the bottom line is keep your mouth shut till you talk to your public defender <laughs> talk to absolutely talk to talk to a lawyer for right. sure right um, oh, something that uh, a point I wanted to make. Maybe you could show us when you're showing the T-shirts. Um, if you are wearing these T-shirts, if you are wearing a T-shirt that says "I do not consent to searches," mm -hmm. it would be very difficult uh, for the police officer to try to convince a judge that you consented 
to a search. Mm. So point, this yeah. is going to be this is pr tremendous uh, protection mm -hmm. uh, in case you were ever in that situation. Uh, sure. It's irrefutable evidence. Well, voluntariness is uh, is the term for that. You know, if you're arguing a, an emotion to suppress evidence, for example, you know, and then the the officer says, "Oh yeah, he consented to the search," you know, or he didn't he didn't say or do anything when I started searching. I mean, it can be kind of a tricky situation, but obviously, if your shirt says you don't <laughs> consent to searches, and, uh, and you were photographed possibly wearing that shirt. Right. On, Particularly uh, if you're going like this, right? The to the station. Um, and you can attest to the fact that you've watched uh, the film Busted, The Citizen's Guide to Surviving Police Encounters repeatedly, and you can have friends get on the stand and testify that you, in fact, are trained to refuse police searches. Mm -hmm. This will certainly help your lawyer out. Since we have been playing the Busted video as part of our Don't Be a Not show, it has come to my attention that there are some in the law enforcement community who have expressed the view that we should not be playing subversive stuff like this. They object to people being told how to protect their rights. This is precisely why this sort of training is important, imperative even. I know it's hard to believe, but there are actually people on the government payroll who, rather than protecting your rights, are content to keep you ignorant as they place you in cuffs. You should not need any more motivation to better understand your rights than this. For Common Sense, I'm Mike Nixon, Six Semper Trainers. Damn it! Oh crap! Oh, this really sucks. Everyone chill out and we'll be fine. Is everything put away? Most avoidable police searches occur not because police have probable cause, but because most people, like Daryl, get tricked or intimidated into consenting to search requests. Now let's repeat what could be the three most important lines you may ever have to deliver in your entire life. Officer, I do not consent to any searches. Officer, am I free to go? Officer, I have nothing to say until I speak with my lawyer. If you've been paying close attention throughout this video, you're now a more intelligent citizen and are more prepared to protect yourself and assert your constitutional rights during police encounters. Mm -hmm.